The story begins with Femisha, a girl marked by misfortune, fleeing into the night as her own villagers chase her. The village chief condemns her, declaring that those born without stars, like Femisha, bring bad luck and shouldn't exist. As dawn breaks, Femisha, exhausted, navigates through the forest to her secret hideouts. She gathers her belongings hidden in magic bags, cookware, books, potions, and other necessities, relieved that her pursuers haven't found her main stash. Femisha is no ordinary girl. She's a human reincarnated from another world. Although her memories of her past life are faint, she occasionally hears whispers from it. Resigned to a life devoid of happiness due to her harsh experience, Femisha decides to emotionally detach from her village that has shunned her. While trying to move forward, she struggles to climb a hill, nearly tumbling off a cliff. Femisha longs for practical skills like others in her village. Her past self reminds her not to lament her birth, urging her to start anew. In her journey, Femisha stumbles upon a dumping ground. Her familiarity with the place suggests she scavenged here before. She rummages through the garbage, finding usable clothes and a map that falls out of a pocket, which could help her navigate. Amidst the trash, she also discovers expired potions. Although discolored, Femisha hopes they might still be effective, musing on the irony of an unwanted child like her relying on discarded items. Her scavenging is interrupted by the sound of a tamer and his slimes nearby, tasked with clearing the trash. Femisha realizes they're searching for her. The tamer, communicating with his colleague, suspects that Femisha is heading to laugh off, the nearest village. They express unease about the chief placing a bounty on a young girl, considering it an extreme measure. Femisha, in shock, overhears her pursuers saying they'll take her dead or alive. Realizing the village chief wants her gone for good, she tries to escape but accidentally falls off a cliff. Luckily, her bag catches on a branch, saving her from a worse fate. Injured, she has to use several healing potions, which are old and not very strong. Later, she finds a clear river and takes a moment to relax, something she's never experienced due to a life spent hiding. Femisha resolves to be bold, recalling the fortune teller's advice to disguise herself as a boy for safer travel. She cuts her hair, changes into boyish clothes, and decides to adopt a new name. Her past self suggests the name Ivy, likening her to the resilient plant. As Ivy continues her journey, she's captivated by a unique, light-emitting slime. Upon closer inspection, she finds it adorable. Checking her monster compendium, she learns it's a rare, unnamed slime, often called the weakest or disintegrating slime. Identifying with the slime's vulnerability, Ivy feels a connection. When a breeze threatens to blow the slime away, she learns it's so delicate it could disappear with a mere touch or strong wind. Ivy gently assists the struggling slime, saddened to read that its lifespan is less than a day. Realizing how little is known about this rare creature due to its brief existence, Ivy is moved by its fragility. Another gust of wind nearly sends the slime into the river, but Ivy quickly saves it. She decides to stay with the slime, understanding its transient nature and wanting to cherish its brief time. In Orjagoos, Ivy explains, humans receive skills marked with stars when they turn five. Her parents had skills in carpentry, needlework, and mending, each marked with stars as a measure of proficiency. These stars, bestowed by the gods, often dictate one's future. However, when Ivy turned five, she received a taming skill but with no stars. Unable to tame even the smallest animal, let alone monsters, she became known as a starless tamer. This revelation changed the way her village, even her own parents, treated her. She lost her sense of belonging. Ivy shares with the slime about her past life and the fortune teller who educated her and gifted her magical bags. These bags could carry numerous items without feeling heavy. Ivy becomes emotional, revealing the fortune teller's recent death, which left her feeling utterly alone. Ivy tells the slime that he is the very first friend she made and wished that they can stay together. The next morning, Ivy wakes up to find the slime gone, thinking it disintegrated as expected. Surprised by her own sadness, she resolves to head to the royal capital, following the fortune teller's advice. To her joy, she finds the slime alive inside her magic bag, proving some information in the compendium wrong. In the forest, Ivy tries taming the slime by channeling her magic into it. The slime glows, accepting her efforts, and she names it Sora, marking the successful taming with a symbol on its forehead. Ivy, excited to have a companion, happily introduces herself to Sora. Later, Ivy traps and butchers her tenth field mouse, showing respect for its sacrifice. She wonders about her previous life's lifestyle, as her past self often reacts strongly to such tasks. Ivy prepares the meat neatly, planning a feast with Sora for the night keeping the slime safe in her bag. Checking her map, Ivy realizes the royal capital isn't even shown, signifying the long journey ahead from her current remote location. Ivy decides to head towards Odol, a nearby town, for safety. A gust of wind almost sweeps away her companion slime, Sora, but she catches him just in time. 
Sensing danger, she quickly hides in the trees, narrowly avoiding a group of monster ants marching by. Once the ants pass, Ivy feels relieved and notices that Sora has grown slightly larger and heavier. She then feels a sting on her face, realizing she's been cut by a branch. Acting quickly, Ivy applies several expired blue potions to her wound, healing it but depleting her potion supply. As she approaches the village, Ivy notices wanted posters with her image and a hefty reward of 500 Dao. Each poster portrays her differently, making her recognize that she's now a fugitive. In the village, Ivy is struck by how much skills and magic are integrated into everyday life. Passing a bakery, she longs for bread, something she hasn't had in a long time. She also considers selling the field mice she's hunted at a butcher's shop but hesitates. The butcher, sensing her presence with his two-star odor skill, invites her over and praises the freshness and quality of her catch, offering her 100 dal for it. He expresses interest in buying more, as most hunters are focused on larger game. With her earnings, Ivy buys bread at an affordable price, amusing the bakery owner with her innocence. The villagers mistake her for a boy, indicating her disguise is effective. Finding a secluded spot, Ivy shares her bread with Sora, but the slime shows no interest in eating. Ivy learns that Sora, the rare slime, communicates no by spreading itself out. She's curious about what it eats. The next day, she successfully catches a bunch of field mice in the forest and finds a dumping ground full of expired potions. To her surprise, Sora devours the blue potions, revealing a unique ability to dissolve inorganic materials, a trait of high-level rare slimes. Ivy tests this by offering a vase to Sora, but the slime refuses. She then offer a red potion he declines that too and shows a preference for blue potions only. The slime sees more blue portion and starts devouring it. Ivy asks him to leave some for her too. After selling her field mice for 250 dao, Ivy visits the bakery and is gifted an extra loaf of bread. She enjoys a peaceful moment by a stream, cleaning up and savoring her bread, wishing these tranquil times would last. Later, she encounters some adventurers and narrowly avoids recognition due to her changed appearance. The adventurers mistake her for a boy and tease her, prompting Ivy to leave quickly. Back in the village, Ivy's fear heightens when she sees her wanted poster. Despite receiving more free bread from the bakery owner, her fear of being discovered forces her to leave the village abruptly. She's saddened to depart, especially since the villagers were kind. On her journey, at a crossroads, Ivy hesitates, unsure of which direction her hunters took. Sora tries to communicate something, but Ivy can't decipher it. Regretting her hasty departure and now hungry and thirsty, she chooses a path and finds a tree with delicious fruits. However, Sora's disapproving gesture and shivering alert her to danger. The tree transforms into a monster, attacking her and revealing her pursuers. In a tense moment, the tree monster's root lunges at her, but Sora saves her just in time. Injured and losing strength, Ivy falls unconscious. She thinks of healing her wound but realizes that she has no potion. Lastly, she sees Sora jump onto her wound. She fears the worst, thinking Sora might be consuming her, as some slimes are known to digest humans. This bring an end to our episode. In Ivy's dream, she remembers her childhood. Her father, Tablo, was a woodcarver who heard a baby's cry one day, signaling the birth of a new family member. He rushed inside and was congratulated for the arrival of a baby girl. Tablo praised his wife for giving birth to such a beautiful child and decided to give his daughter a name. Ivy's mother loved the name and they introduced themselves. As Ivy grew older, she started bringing lunch to her older brother and father while they worked. They would take a break and enjoy the bread she brought. One time, Ivy almost choked on her food, but her father quickly summoned water to help her. Her older brother teased her for eating too quickly, but Ivy explained that she needed to eat a lot because she was growing. Tableau laughed and expressed his wish for her to grow big and strong. Her older brother complained that their father was always lenient with Ivy. When they returned home in the evening, they were greeted by her elder sister, Facilla. Facilla asked Ivy to set the table for dinner, and her brother teased her about when she would start using everyday magic. Ivy confidently replied that she would start using it soon. Her mother reassured her that there was no need to rush, as everyone develops at their own pace. Ivy's ability to help with housework at such a young age was admirable. Facilla mentioned that their mother had eagerly anticipated Ivy starting to use everyday magic at her age, which sometimes made Ivy feel like she received special treatment for being the youngest. During dinner, Facilla, their mother, served everyone's favorite stew. They all enjoyed the meal together, and Tableau mentioned how Facilla's soothing skill helped him relax after a long day of work. The family spent quality time together, completing various tasks and sharing updates about their day. Tableau talked about his work and Ivy's older brother mentioned that he would finish making the furniture that week. He also praised their mother's sewing skills and quickly completing the sofa cushions. 
Ivy noticed her mother crying, and she apologized, explaining that she was sewing bridal wear for the shoemaker's daughter. This made her realize that she would do the same for her own daughters in the future. Vasila, one of Ivy's sisters, asked for a fancy dress, and Tableau, the father, felt like that future was far away. Fulfi reassured him it would come quicker than he thought, and Tableau acknowledged that Ivy was already five years old. The family discussed how Ivy would receive her skills at this age. Tableau explained that having a skill meant finding a place to work and earn a living. Ivy's older brother, who had a three-star skill, emphasized the security it brought. He took a dig at Facilla. Fulfi asked Ivy what skill she wanted, and Ivy wished for the tamer skill to be friends with dragons and monsters. Tableau reminded her that skills were gifts from the gods to help them live in their world and just being friends with creatures might not be enough. To cheer Ivy up, Tableau gave her a freshly carved unicorn. Their family time was interrupted by Luba, the fortune teller, who apologized for coming late but wanted to pray for Ivy's good fortune as it was nearly time for her to receive her skill. Fulfi appreciates the concern and allows it. The fortune teller remembers how young Ivy used to talk about her past life. Ivy's mother complained to Luba, who warned Ivy not to let anyone know about these memories, as it could cause problems. Not even her parents should know about them. The fortune teller finished praying for Ivy, assuring everyone that she would receive a wonderful skill. However, she couldn't predict the exact skill since her fortune-telling ability was only one star. Ivy's older brother made disrespectful comments about the one-star ability, leading his father to scold him and his mother to apologize to Luba on his behalf. The day of Ivy's skill ceremony arrived, and they went to the church. The priest asked Ivy to dip her finger into the chalice and called upon God to gift her with the power to earn her sustenance. The water levitated, indicating a divine message. It initially confirmed that she had the tamer skill, making her and her parents happy. However, the bubble burst, and the priest was informed that Ivy had no stars. Her parents were in disbelief, with Tableau thinking it was a mistake. They were told that the divine message couldn't be wrong, and further denial would be considered blasphemous. The priest left in disbelief, considering Ivy abandoned by the gods. Ivy turned to her parents, and her past self likened the situation to an impossibly hard video game. That evening, the family gathered, and Tableau showed frustration by hitting the table and drinking alcohol. Fulfi tried to stop him, but he couldn't understand why their youngest didn't have stars when everyone else in the family did. Ivy tried to speak, but she was told to be quiet. Tableau even doubted if Ivy was truly his child leading to Fulfi breaking down in tears. Ivy tried to comfort her mother, but her older brother shouted at her not to touch their mother. Facilla goes upstairs and watches in disgust as Ivy's older brother kicks her out of the house. As Ivy walks through the streets, news of her being starless has already spread. People give her condescending looks, and even the village chief expresses hatred towards her. He tells the villagers that Ivy's starlessness is an omen of impending disasters, and they must gather and prepare for misfortune. Some children throw stones at her because she doesn't have stars. Feeling unwelcome, Ivy decides to leave the village. It starts raining, and she becomes hungry. She tries to eat some berries but realizes they are inedible. Ivy takes refuge in a cave and attempts to use her magic to start a fire, but she faints. When she wakes up, she's under a blanket next to a warm fire, and she's surprised to see Luba. Luba informs her that she has less magical energy than most people and warns her not to overexert herself with magic, as it could endanger her life. The fortune teller had foreseen this event but couldn't see its cause until now. She's a bit surprised that being starless was the reason for Ivy's predicament. Luba offers Ivy a comforting bowl of soup, and once she regains her strength, she begins to teach her. She assures Ivy that with the right knowledge, she can achieve almost anything despite her limited magical energy. Luba provides Ivy with a starter pack for her journey, including an old model magic bag that can carry many things and make them feel lighter. Ivy also receives books filled with information about the world, which Luba believes will be useful on her journey. The fortune teller advises Ivy to travel the world and broaden her horizons when the time comes. She suggests heading to a town near the royal capital, but encourages Ivy to settle down if she finds a place she loves during her journey. Luba emphasizes the importance of trust and openness with allies, as hiding things can lead to a loss of trust, and Ivy will need trustworthy allies when the time for battle arrives. Luba, the old lady, teaches Ivy essential survival skills while taking care of her in the forest. Ivy is puzzled by Luba's kindness because everyone else despises her for being starless. Luba shares a piece of history, telling Ivy that in the past, no one had skills or stars, and people lived happily and functioned without them. After three years in the forest, Ivy adapts to her nomadic life and becomes skilled at finding useful things in trash bins. She also learns how to hunt animals for food and cook them properly. One day, while enjoying her meal, Ivy realizes that Luba hasn't visited in a while. 
She senses a presence nearby and hides, confident that it's not a monster. Ivy extinguishes her fire and hides in the bushes as she recognizes people from her village. She suspects that something has happened there. That evening, she sneaks into the village church and overhears that Luba has passed away. Luba was a vital part of the village, and her death is puzzling, especially as it occurred in the summer due to a cold. Ivy lingers to hear her father report to the village leader, shocked to hear him say they will return her to the gods. Emotional turmoil prevails as she listens to the village leader's hate-filled speech, blaming Ivy for Luba's death and calling her a curse because she is starless. He incites the villagers to hunt Ivy down before she brings disaster to their settlement. Ivy awakens from her dream, thinking she has been captured by her parents. She finds Sora on her wound and falls back asleep. The next morning, she is awakened by her slime familiar, and the familiar jumps on her. Ivy reaches for it and realizes her terrible wound has healed. She understands that the slime wasn't trying to harm her but was helping her. Ivy expresses gratitude to the slime for saving her life, and promises to try to live a little longer. Sora and Ivy were asleep when a drop of water woke up Sora. Ivy noticed it was morning and saw that Sora was unusually energetic. They have breakfast before starting their journey. Ivy has mixed berries, and Sora consumes potions. Ivy notices that Sora has grown taller, nimbler, and sturdier, thanks to the blue potions it's been eating. Ivy doesn't bother figuring out how it's happening, she just attributes it to the slime getting healthier. Realizing she's almost out of dried meat, Ivy plans to restock in the next village of Latam. To fund this, she needs to catch enough field mice. Her past self thinks it would be cheaper to cook the meat she catches, but Ivy explains that cooking in the forest attracts monsters. Buying dried meat costs more but is safer in the long term. Sora informs Ivy that it has eaten all its potions and demands more, but she has none left. They set off and come across a dumping ground, hoping to find potions. Ivy finds clothes, but Sora insists on finding potions. After a short search, Ivy finds a box of old potions. Sora eats one and Ivy speculates that the slime will eat anything as long as it's blue. It even eats a practice healing potion made by a child. Ivy is shocked to see it in just a red one, curing illnesses. Sora rejected it before, indicating a broadened palate. Ivy presents a green and purple potion, but Sora rejects them. Following her past self's suggestion, she mixes blue and red to make purple. Sora eats it, confirming it bases selection on properties, not color. The duo continues, happy with the nice weather. Ivy is grateful to have met Sora, making her journey less lonely. Her past lives remind her they're always with her, but she excludes them as they are one person. Spotting some no berries, she forgets her trail of thought, eats them, and comments on their deliciousness, offering some to Sora, but Sora rejects them. That evening, Ivy serves herself a portion of no berries and gives Sora its dose of potion. She wishes they could travel down paths lined with these berries as Sora finishes its food. Ivy is a bit surprised and gives Sora three more as dessert. Sora eats that too and demands more, making Ivy complain because she needs some for when she gets injured on the road. The slime pressures her to give up more. Her past life suggests putting the creature to bed since it will get hungry as long as it's awake. Ivy picks up Sora and tells it that she's going to tell it a bedtime story. They climb up a tree to set up for the night. Ivy reveals that it's a story she heard a lot when she was little. Long ago, the world was at war, so a king gathered magicians who could see the future and had them predict the outcome of the war. They saw the end of the world due to this conflict, and it was a terrifying sight. The magician summoned a child from another world who could use unique and forgotten magic to prevent this fate. This power doesn't exist anymore, and no one knows the effects. However, it is vast, scary, quiet, and lonely. A water drops and it lands on Sora, who wakes up in alarm clock mode. Ivy wakes up and is shocked to see that it's morning. Her past self reveals that she fell asleep while telling the bedtime story. The girl confesses that the story always makes her feel sleepy, so she never heard it to the end. Ivy suddenly becomes alert and checks her bag to see that Sora has eaten all her blue and red potion. The girl is visibly annoyed for a moment, but just lets out a moan. She later sets up a trap in hopes of catching a field mouse. They both jump up in excitement when they capture something. As she makes her way to retrieve her prey, she comments on how much of a big help being able to trade field mice for money has been. She must earn and save money to continue their journey. They suddenly both jolt back when the monster snake she captured lunges at them. She is a little confused as she was expecting a field mouse. She feels like she might be able to sell it. Ivy pulls out a sack from one of her magic bags and quickly covers the snake. After a brief struggle, she manages to tie the mouth of the sack, which calms the creature. She slings it over her shoulder and continues when she smells something. Sora gives his danger a head gesture that Ivy doesn't see. The girl wonders if it's a monster, but she doesn't sense anything like that, so she goes to investigate further. 
She gasps when she comes across the aftermath of an attack. Ivy orders Sora to get inside her bag in case there are any bandits, as they will target it. The scene gets worse when she stumbles on the corpses of the people in the caravan. She grabs her sack and runs quite a distance until she's confident that she's safe. When she finally catches her breath, she notices the large village of Latam in the distance. Ivy enters and immediately looks for someone to report the incident to. The girl spots the sign for the town hall and heads over there. She interrupts the receptionist's conversation with some adventurers. Ivy informs them about the monster snake in her bag when they ask. One of the guys points her to the apothecary if she wants to trade in the monster. She thanks him for the information. However, she informs them of the deceased people she found on her way to the village. This catches the attention of everyone present. The receptionist asks her to come closer to give more details. Ivy states that it was on the road from Latoto village. She describes how the cart was on fire and people were attacked by monsters. One of the adventurers gets up after hearing this. The receptionist explains that their village could be attacked next if this is true. The party leader speculates that it could have been a bandit attack, but Ivy doubts it based on their wounds. She also points out that the cart horses were also eliminated. If it was a bandit attack, they would have taken the valuable horses. After hearing this, the party leader urgently asks to find the exact location and type of monster responsible for the attack. He plans to submit a formal request through the guild later. Everyone gets up after receiving their orders. The guy thanks Ivy and informs her that she will get a tip reward after they confirm the location. The receptionist can see she's confused, so she explains that people get money for bringing information to any town hall about monsters or people who have passed away from monster attacks. It is more advantageous for them to have information about monsters as quickly as possible. This allows them to deal with the problem before people get hurt. She gives Ivy a document that she would need to present to collect her reward if her information is reliable. The results should be available by the evening. Ivy thanks them and makes her way to the apothecary as directed. The vendor examines the snake monster and informs her that the normal market price for this monster is too guidle. However, she caught a female which is rare, so he's willing to pay three. Ivy is shocked to hear this and begins to do her calculations. One giddle is equivalent to 100 dows, so three giddle is worth 30 field mice. From her reaction, the vendor thinks that she's not happy with the payment. The girl assures him that she is fine with the offer, and the trader asks her to bring them to him if she catches any more. She leaves the shop amazed that she earned three whole giddle, which means she can buy lots of dried meat for her journey. She suggests to Sora that they should go look for some food for it, so they head to the village dump. She wonders if they will find any potions around. The girl gets excited when she spots a load of magic bags. She stacks them, and there are 21 in total. As she thinks about how to take them along with her, Sora hops around eating the potions lying around. There is only so much she can carry while walking. The bags are also older models, so their abilities are all different. Her past self recommends she try putting the magic bags into one another. She puts the first one in and it works. She tries to put that bag into another one, but it doesn't go in. So after trial and error, she figures out the capacity of each bag, and she groups them accordingly. After that, she finds the right order to put the bags in so that everything can fit into one. They head to the town center where Ivy comes across the Adventurer's Guild. She puts up her hood afraid that someone might recognize her. As she tentatively passes through, she is called by the party leader. He informs her that the information she provided has saved a lot of lives, and they were able to verify everything she reported. The monsters that conducted the attacks were ogres along with an ogre king. Their tracks were around the wagon. Some high-ranked adventurers are being sent to hunt them down. So he warns her not to leave the village till the monsters are defeated. The guy also tells her that her reward tip is available at the guild hall. So she goes straight there. The receptionist asks for the document. Ivy must remove all her new bags to find it. She presents the document and is given five guidel for the information on the five deceased people and reward for the information on the high-ranked monsters. Ivy does the working out and she would need to hunt 280 field mice to make this kind of money. Before she leaves, the receptionist pleads with her to be careful with that large amount of money. She also reminds her to send her bags along. Ivy thinks that everyone is after her money when they stare at her, but she finds out that it's because of the bag she's carrying. Ivy heeds the party leader's advice and camps in the village with some other warriors. She looks at her map at their next destination, which is a bigger village called Laddle. We then see that Ivy left Laddam village and ventured into the forest after the powerful monsters were finally defeated. She felt a bit frustrated because the traps she had set up were broken and hadn't caught any creatures. She thought maybe something had stepped on them, and worried she wouldn't make any money if she couldn't catch any prey. But her past self reminded her they still had some supplies left. When Sora saw something and ran into the bushes, Ivy followed. 
As she got closer, she sensed something ahead and smelled red residue. Ivy found a badly hurt big cat in the bushes. Sensing some magic from it, she thought it must be a monster. Looking it up in her monster book, she found it resembled a creature called an adendal, described as fierce. The injured creature startled her when it cried out in pain. Seeing how bad its injury was, Ivy knew it wouldn't survive much longer. Feeling sad, she tried to comfort it during its final moments, understanding its pain from her own near-death experience. Ivy strokes the cat, wishing she could have done more to help it. Suddenly, Sora jumps in and surrounds the creature, healing its wounds quickly. As the slime returns to Ivy's hand, she notices its speech pattern has changed, but a monster's shadow nearby makes them both flinch. The tension fades as the cat purrs, showing gratitude for being saved. Ivy reads in her book that it takes five skilled adventurers to defeat the Adandal, making her realize how dangerous it is. Examining the creature closely, Ivy finds it cute and doubts if it's truly an Adandal. As she continues through the forest, the cat follows her. Ivy is surprised but happy to have a new friend. She wishes she could have tamed it fully but settles for naming it Seal. Ivy introduces herself and Sora before they continue together for a bit until Ivy senses people nearby. Sora jumps into her bag to stay safe, while the big cat says goodbye and dashes into the bushes, knowing people would be scared if they saw it. Ivy is surprised the cat is smart enough to understand. After a short walk, she arrives at the gates of Latomi village. She feels nervous about going in when she sees a tough-looking man guarding the gate. A traveler rudely pushes past her and heads toward the gate. Sora warns of danger ahead. The man freezes when Ajito, the guard, tells him to stop and starts questioning him about his reasons for being there. The guard becomes suspicious and throws the man against the wall when he can't give a clear answer about who he's visiting. Agto opens the bag, and many bottles of illegal happy juice spill out. He calls Velivra to arrest the criminal. Another guard thinks Agto should show some kindness to the wrongdoers. Ivy watches and is amazed that Sora sensed the man was bad. She's afraid to approach the gate because of Agto's intimidating presence, but he catches her eye so she can't back down or look suspicious. She gathers her courage and goes forward, but Agto stops her. He doesn't recognize her and asks about her parents, looming over her. Ivy notices a bug on his shoulder and points it out, which makes him panic a little as he brushes it off. This breaks the tension, but he still wants to know about her family. Ivy says she's from Latom Village. He's surprised she's so far from home alone and sympathizes with the difficulties her village faces. Ivy is puzzled by his sympathy. Agto suggests she could make a living as an adventurer in the village. The guard says goodbye as Ivy enters the village, curious about what's happening back home. Ivy is impressed by the village's grandeur and heads straight to the butchers. The butcher welcomes her and assures Ivy that they'll buy any fresh prey she catches. The butcher warns Ivy to be careful in the forest, especially because she hunts alone, mentioning monsters called Nanoshi in the area. Ivy thanks her for the advice, buys some dried meat, and leaves. She thinks the Nanoshi might have broken her traps for field mice. Her past self advises against sleeping in the forest while they're in the village. Ivy agrees and goes to the adventurer's clearing to rest. She's amazed by its size, considering the village scale. She's scared to approach another guard she sees, but she does anyway. After a few questions, he gives her a pass and directs her to the section best suited for her situation. He then give her a permit, so that she can come and go without any problem. Ivy sets up her mat and lies down but notices some big tents far away. She wonders if that's where the more experienced adventurers gather. Sitting up, she sees her area filled with small tents and guesses it's for beginners like herself. She admires both types of tents and thinks it would be nice to have one, as it would keep her and Sora safer from the weather and hidden from sight. Remembering she has reward money from the tip, Ivy goes to the market to check prices for second-hand tents. She runs into Ajito, who asks what she's looking for, startling each other. Velivra asks him not to scare Ivy. They find out Ivy wants to buy a tent, and Ajito is surprised she doesn't have one. He wonders if she lost everything when leaving her village, which confirms to them the hardships her village faces. They introduce themselves to Ivy, and Otto eagerly takes her to a great shop run by a skilled old man. Velivra warns Ajito to be careful not to hurt Ivy while pulling her. As an apology, Ajito promises to help Ivy find the best tent. When they reach the old man's shop, he jokes with Ajito that there's nothing for him to buy. He tells the blacksmith he's brought a customer, and shows sympathy when he learns Ivy is from Latom Village. The guard asks for a high price for a quality tent. The old man explains the different durability levels of tents, mostly based on weight. Ivy is more worried about the price, but she's told it depends on her budget. When she says she only has five Giddle, they're surprised. Ivy reveals she has two more gold coins, but doesn't want to spend them. The guards are shocked and wonder how she got so much money. 
Ivy explains she got a reward from Ladom Village for tipping them off about a monster attack. The guards are just glad she's safe. The old man says she can get a good tent for five gittle. He shows them a light and sturdy tent, the latest model, previously owned by an adventurer named Lazy Joya who hardly used it before quitting to get married. The old man had upgraded the tent and offers it to Ivy for five gittle, which is a great deal considering it's the same price he paid for it before the upgrade. After they seal the deal, he asks Ivy to mark the tent so she can recognize it easily. She chooses the name Sora in Japanese kanji, a name she feels connected to from her past life. As a bonus, the old man gives Ivy a small magic bag to keep her money safe. It's enchanted so nobody else can see what's inside. Ivy is really thankful for the gift. The trio leaves the shop, and Ivy feels happy about her purchases. She thanks the guards for their help. Velivera reminds them they need to get back to patrolling, so Ajito says goodbye. Ivy heads back to the clearing and sets up her new tent without any problems. She brings Sora out to show him their new home, feeling relieved they'll be protected from the weather. Sora seems just as excited as she is. Ivy feels lucky to have gotten the money, and such a good deal on the tent, making her feel like she got it for free. Ivy wonders if she's allowed to have all these nice things, but decides to celebrate anyway. She plans to go to the city's dump to look for potions while it's still daytime. Since the village is big, she figures people must have thrown away lots of stuff there. As she steps out, some rude adventurers notice her. They come over and accuse her of being a thief, which confuses Ivy. One of them claims her tent belongs to him, but Ivy insists she bought it. This angers the group's leader, who calls her a liar and grabs her. They insult her and try to scare her, but a guard steps in and warns them to behave or get kicked out. The adventurers continue lying, saying Ivy stole the tent. The guard asks for proof, but they can't provide any. They just claim Ivy can't afford such a tent. The guard lets Ivy go and reveals that Acto is the captain of the village watch and Belivera is the vice. He tells the adventurers that Acto and Belivera escorted Ivy to buy the tent. Ivy is surprised to learn that Acto and Belivera are important people in the village. The troublemakers back off, but it's too late, they're caught by the other guards. Agto tells the guard to watch over Ivy and make sure she's safe. As an apology for what happened, the guard gives Ivy a new healing potion. That evening, Ivy is amazed by the potion's quality. She gives Sora his potions while she eats, but he refuses because he senses the new potion in her bag. Ivy decides not to give it to Sora in case they need it for an emergency. This brings an end to our episode. See you with the new episode next week until then subscribe to our channel and check out our other videos.